Marbang, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hilal Dadia. We have with us Seth Freeman, CIRA, CTP, MD at Birelli Advisors, uh, Advisory Services joining in. Welcome to the show, Seth, and always a pleasure to speak to you and get insights from you. Seth, Thank my you. first question coming to you is, overall, what do you make of the global macroeconomic scenario that we are seeing, especially in the US as well as the Europe? Plus, you have China, which is now starting to open up. So how do you see it impacting? Well, it's not looking very good at uh, multiple uh, viewpoints, whether you're looking at uh, the stock market and, and market indices. If you're starting, we're starting to see softness in housing prices. Uh, we're starting to see tech companies uh, doing hiring freezes and um, having a tough time raising fresh capital. So it's, and, and then we have obviously a giant geopolitical problem with Russia and Ukraine and NATO and the, the Euro, EU, uh, Finland and Sweden in the EU. So uh, we're, we have a lot of dynamic events going on all at once. Absolutely. So taking the scenario into consideration, what's your view on the equity markets as a whole? You know, we get asked that every time, and, and I think it's always about how long of a time horizon an investor has. Um, I was reading some articles today. There's a number of, of leading uh, financial pundits who think that, that um, the S&P could go down to 3,100, which is almost another 20% more. Mm. We're already at around 20%. We're, we're looking at... Um, uh, word of a possible um, 75 basis point <coughs> increase in interest rates again, and, and that's going to cause trouble for companies. And being in the restructuring business that we are here in the United States, it's been very quiet, frankly, in terms of Chapter 11 cases and announcements of a lot of distress. There's sort of been a shortage of Chapter 11 cases for restructuring professionals to work on. But we've seen an uptick, that, frankly, in the last two to three weeks. And that may uh, be a sign of things to come. So what is it signaling, according to you? What is it signaling? Um, it's signaling that uh, the, the, even though there are nuggets of growth and positive factors in the economy that that it is slowing down, that we're, we're going to have slower, much slower economic growth. We, uh, it's very difficult to hire people. Wages are, rate, are rising dramatically. A lot of inf just inflation across the board. I was in Los Angeles, gas is $7.10 a gallon. That's not sustainable for average Americans. And we're seeing, because uh, oil is priced globally, you've got the same problems in India, and, and, and any, any other place where pe people have to buy uh, petroleum products. So it's, it's extremely negative. And there's, there's a lot of concern about going into a, a real recession, not just a brief period of high inflation and economic slowdown. So if US gets into a recessionary phase, what's the kind of impact that you're seeing on emerging markets like India? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I was just looking at comparative indices, especially, you know, the Nifty and the Sensex and the S&P in particular. And we've done much worse <coughs> with the S&P compared to India. Uh, but um, because India really is such a huge net importer of oil, I think this is going to be a real overhang. And, and I also think that in terms of India and some of my uh, Indian friends disagree with what I'm going to say, and I'm sorry, but I think there's a point at which um, the Modi government and, and Modi himself is going to have to come out and be a, a proponent of, of sanctions and other actions against Russia in regard to Ukraine. I, I know that there are many reasons why uh, India wants to uh, assert its independence 
and its strength and to not align itself. But I think that's going to have long-term ramifications. Mm. Um, and, and, and this affects emerging markets more broadly because um, it, it doesn't look like the Ukrainian situation and Russia's invasion of Ukraine is going to go away very quickly. And it's going to it's going to really affect allocation of money flows to emerging markets. And, and frankly, the situation with Ukraine is going to push up global uh, farm product prices. And that's also going to, well, that could have a positive effect on emerging markets that can sell commodities, sell food products to replace some of what's tied up in Ukraine. But it's just negative, frankly, on a broad scale. Right. So overall, if you see in terms of where, uh, you know, even in, in terms of the, I mean, we know growth is slowing down. Inflation mm -hmm. is a major concern. Mm -hmm. We are talking of a recessionary phase. To that, how are you seeing the U.S. Treasury yields move? Because right now, if you go to seats of session, where we are seeing some bit of easing that's happening in terms of the U.S. Treasury yields, and you mm -hmm. have seen the dollar, which did rise in yesterday's session as well, post yeah. the comments that we heard from uh, Powell. He's clearly mm -hmm. indicating that there is a risk that the U.S. central bank's interest rate hikes will slow the economy too much. But the bigger risk is persistent inflation. Now, with all of this, how are you seeing the bond yields move? Uh, bond yields, it, it depends. I think we're going to see bond yields move up. And I think it's going to become very expensive for uh, lower performing, higher risk companies to borrow. And um, it's going to affect the bond market significantly because the higher, the higher interest rates you know, set a new floor. And there's also going to be this transitional period with LIBOR uh, going away. That's gonna create the need to for a lot of borrowers to enter into new documents. And, and there's not a better opportunity to raise interest rates when your borrower has to uh, sign new documents. That's, that's from a mechanical standpoint. It, it's, again, it puts, it puts pressure on growth. And if the Fed goes too far, and that is what the fear is, that we're going to see a recession. And, and, and the problem is, it's so hard because there's time lags and it, it's so easy for the Fed to raise rates too rapidly. Mm. With, and, and then it takes a long time to recover from, from that kind of uh, overshoot. Right. And overall, Seth, you know, with the Chinese economy now opening up slowly, steadily, do you mm -hmm. think that's something which is going to act as a positive trigger? Um, not particularly, frankly. Um, and one of the reasons is China's domestic real estate market is a disaster. Uh, there are there is such a gigantic overhang of real estate related loans to developers, and um, that's going to suck up just a tremendous amount of capital. And uh, again, there are, at, the, at least at the present time from the U.S. perspective, there's, there's just a lot of issues in um, increasing investment in China uh, politi politically. And I, I think there, that's going to also constrain, um, constrain you know, money flows. It's all about money flows. And it's all about confidence in, in um, uh, governance and the legal system. And um, and, and civil rights. And I think we're gonna see the convergence of those things um, as a negative for China, frankly. Right, so overall from here on Seth, according to you, what are the key factors we should be watching out for? Um, I, I'm still very positive on India long-term. And um, we're just going to see a, you know continued growth in consumer, consum in, in consumer consumption. Um, you know, even when, when auto business was down, I was still bullish long-term on, on that area. There's, there's a real opportunity for, uh, con for continued uh, techno technology 
um, being created in India and exported, uh, not just services, but but a lot of a lot of new technology. In in terms of emerging markets, I think we're going to, as I mentioned, emerging markets will benefit from high uh, food food prices and agricultural product prices. That's going to be a real positive. Um, I really think that's about it in the meantime, in, until we see what's happening globally and in terms of, of Russia, Ukraine. I think it's a bigger overhang than we kind of feel. You know, this war has been going on now for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And um, we start to get a little jaded. Uh, some other news has overwhelmed the kind of war news that at least we're seeing here every day on the TV. And um, it's important not to um, let that get out of our focus just because other temporal news uh, replaces that. Um, so I, I guess I'm kind of pessimistic today during this interview, mm. but we, we also have to remember this, these are all cycles. Mm. Um, and again, depending on what, where you are in your, if you're uh, an investor, where you are in your life cycle. See, I'm, I'm getting older now, right? So I see the NASDAQ go, or S&P go down 20% in, in three to four months. That hurts. Um, but for institutional investors, they're going to be investing long-term. There's, there's also an important factor. Private equity firms and venture capital firms still have a tremendous amount of, of fresh capital that has to be invested. And they're... They make money either by selling their portfolio companies to other funds or having those companies go public and have an exit mm. or a partial exit. And that, that is going to continue to be robust, I think. And we're going to see um, pressure from, from the private equity firms and venture capital firms to harvest uh, companies where they can make a nice multiple. So I, I do think that's going to be a, a lot of upside. Uh, in the next 12 months. Absolutely. So things this should be that we should be watching out for as well. Thank you, Seth, so much for joining us on the show. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, get insights from you. Thank you. Stay safe and speak to you soon again. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for in-depth interviews of India Inc. and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates.